Uh, I think I can start to announce the pre-poll result of the first debate, uh, if, if that would please you, Your Honour. Um, and also, yes, I do apologise most profoundly for the submissive PE, uh, although now I've said it, I quite like it, I think, which is better, though, than the, uh, the term that it was being used yesterday, uh, the BFC, I think if some of you know what I'm talking about, I think we'll just call it the big bad clot, because we're <laughs> ladies. Um, but we have, is emergency medicine a failed paradigm? Yes, 13%. No, 87%. So by the end of this, th that debate, please try and poll again and we shall see who conquers. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, this, our first fight, two heavyweight champions, Scott Weingart and Simon Carley. Their topic is emergency medicine is a failed paradigm. Scott, as you know, Simon, as you know, both are very young in their career. They're just starting out, so try to give them a little bit of applause, try to give them a little bit of encouragement. They're just getting going in their careers. Big round of applause for Scott and Simon. I don't think anybody wants to see that here. Have, have a seat, my friend. I will. All right. So I'm pro for the fact that emergency medicine is a failed paradigm, at least in North America, and I suspect in the UK as well, though maybe Simon will educate me. The problem is emergency physicians are not a failed paradigm. Emergency physicians are fucking incredible. And that's the problem, is no matter how bad things get, no matter how ridiculous your profession, you'll just find a way to make it work. But at some point, that's not going to continue. At some point, it's going to get so bad that you'll realize it's not your fault, it's the fault of your specialty. This is a talk about stories. The stories we tell ourselves, the stories the hospital tells about us, the stories we tell our patients. At the beginning of emergency medicine, I was told this was the story they were telling. There are a lot of sick patients out there. We're going to make a specialty to take care of them. Then, since there's probably going to be some downtime, if there's some not sick patients that show up, when we get to them, after taking care of the sick ones, we'll see them as well. And if there's too many sick patients, they could wait a little while. Seems like a good story. There were some critically ill patients in there as well. And the system was designed for them to stay 20, 30 minutes in the department. The emergency physician would stabilize them, send them up to the ICU. When these were our boxes, everything seemed to be pretty concordant with the story we told ourselves and the reality. But then some extra boxes came. There was this box on the far right. <laughs> and then there was this box. Patients critically ill staying way beyond 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Now, the real problem is that these two boxes, they don't get along so well. They don't get along in flow. They don't get along in time management. But perhaps most importantly, they don't get along in the mindset of the physician that has to take care of both of those boxes. It's very difficult to do both. It's very difficult to be good at both. Which boxes do you identify with? When you tell the story of what you are, are you a doctor that takes care of sick patients? Because if you are, then your story doesn't mesh with reality because that's not what you do very much. For some places, some EDs, that's actually what they do. I worked in one of those EDs. My previous shop at Elmhurst, we took care of sick patients. The stories and reality met. Your story might be that you want to be the primary care doctor for a huge swath of the population that doesn't want to go somewhere else. You're just fine. Your specialty is not failing you. 
But if you're telling yourself you take care of sick patients, you might have a problem. Ask yourself which boxes the system wants optimized. This is a fantastic quote, Peter Babylon. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. It's almost a tautology, but it's absolutely true. It's not that the system is broken. The system is getting what it wants. And this one, what gets measured gets managed. What does get measured in emergency medicine? Where are the incentives? What are we told we should do by all the regulations, at least in North America, Canada? They tell you patient wait times matter, and here's what I'll tell you. If you want to see an ED that takes good care of sick patients, then the patients in the waiting room are waiting 12 to 16 hours. Or they're just not busy enough to take care of sick patients. Because if they're both busy enough to be good at it and actually caring about those patients, then wait times go out the window because the sick go first. Patient satisfaction. I'm all for making my patients happy. I want them to leave satisfied. But the things they are satisfied on are not the things that I care about as an emergency physician. Going to the ED should be the worst day of your life. It should suck. But if you leave, <laughs> if you leave better, or we figure out what's wrong with you and fix it, or we put you in the hospital appropriately, then you should be satisfied. And if you think it's gonna be a spa experience, if you think it's a five-star hotel, then you are deluded. But that's what the system wants. They want patients to go home with a big smile on their face because people greeted them nicely and treated them instantly. The only patients that'll happen on are the not sick patients. In Canada, there's something called the Patient Improvement Act. Level four and five triage, the patients with barely anything wrong with them at all must be seen within two hours. Everyone else, eh, no regs. That's worrisome. Four-hour rule in Simon's neck of the woods. You need to get patients out of the department within four hours. Who is that optimizing? It means the ED becomes a triage officer for the sick patients, and they scurry around trying to get the not sick ones out within those four hours. What is that optimizing? What do hospitals think we're experts on? Find out what your hospital, where they go when they want to find out about airway. Most places, it's anesthesia. Sick patients, intensive care units. They want to find out about trauma, they go to a surgeon. Because the story they tell themselves about emergency physicians is not the story you tell yourself. What stories do we tell the families of our critically ill patients? We tell them, we're going to provide the best care for your loved one. But unless you have one nurse for every two patients who are critically ill, the story is a lie. Is there a better way? Well, there's two ways we could fix this story reality mismatch. We could change the system or we could change the doctors in emergency medicine. Changing the system would be just fine. EM becomes a specialty of resuscitation and acute critical care. You could hire internal medicine and family practice doctors in the ED to see the patients that are not sick or not that sick. And then you incentivize the care of sickest patients first. You make that the metrics by which we are all judged. You say it's a pipe dream, it happens in Japan. It can happen, but I have no hope it will. The system is too strong and it wants what it wants. So then what, what, what can we fix? We could fix the doctors. Stop calling it emergency medicine. That was our first mistake. When I first started in the profession, we were called ER doctors. And people look at this as a slight, as a, as a way of maligning the specialty. But this is the biggest truth out there, because that's what we do. These were doctors that took care of any patient that came to the emergency department or the emergency room. That's what we were. And at some point, there was a political shift to emergency medicine. That sells the wrong story. It should be EDM, a per emergency department medicine because that's what we do. We don't take care of emergencies, we take care of every single patient that comes to the emergency department. That would be a story that matched reality. And that could be a story you could get behind, because there's a beauty in that. 
And then you start recruiting EDM doctors for what they'll actually be doing. You don't tell them lies. You don't teach them about all of the sexy critical care and pretend that's going to be 99% of their practice. You tell them, here's the job. Do you want to work there? And then train them for those things. We need to specialize in EDM or generalize because we'll be the last generalist in what we actually see primary care, hypertension, diabetes, mental health, drug addiction, end of life planning. Keep training in acute resuscitation and stabilization, but don't tell them they're going to be taking care of those patients for a few hours like we're doing now. You need to know the skills for those first 20 minutes. So you're saying, I would never want to do that job. And bunch of you, I agree, you probably wouldn't. But the new people coming in would. As to what to do to the current crop, we'll figure it out. But at least the future generations aren't being sold the same bill of goods that we were. And docs will go into it. Half of the staff at the ED at Janus General, when Urgy Cares became a reality, left emergency medicine and are now practicing exactly what I'm talking about, taking care of the not that sick in a controlled fashion in a way they enjoy. And there's a huge portion of our specialty that actually the story they tell themselves is that emergency medicine is the safety net for people that don't have other doctors. We want to be doing primary care. We want to be taking care of these patients. And the sick ones, someone else could do that. So there are people in our specialty who have the right stories. And community ERs are already doing everything perfectly. Rural ERs, as Simon mentioned, their job doesn't need to be changed. All that needs to be changed is get rid of the patient satisfaction scores, stop telling them that they have to see the not sick patients with some urgency, and let them keep doing exactly what they're doing. And then who takes care of those critically ill patients in the emergency department if the EDM folks are not? Create a new specialty, call it resuscitation, and then that story matches as well. We define ourselves by our stories. And when there's a mismatch, a discordance between the stories we tell ourselves and reality, that leads to cognitive dissonance. That leads to burnout. We either need to change the story or change the reality. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Nat. Thanks, Scott. Oh, emergency medicine is not a failed paradigm. Scott, that was interesting and uh, really very positive. I feel really good about myself now. <laughs> and I'm sure you're feeling the love from the room about all these people who can't do the job that they've been trained for. It's interesting, difficult. Just close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes and take yourself back to a time earlier in your life. Maybe when you're in your late teens or early 20s. That time when you used to watch TV programs about medicine. The MASH that we saw on day one. ER, casualty from the UK. And what kind of doctor or nurse or paramedic would you want to be? Were you not inspired by that ability to look after people? regardless of what their problem was, to deal with them at their moment of need, not when you considered that they were at need, but when they needed help across a wide spectrum of disease. If you're like me, that will be a familiar memory. And that's kind of where emergency medicine is. And when we say emergency medicine, let's not just think about the doctors, because emergency medicine is more than just the doctors in the department. It's all the things that we do and all the people in it. Now, this isn't going to be a cage fight. We don't do cage fights in Britain. It's, it's rude. Um, we could do... <laughs> if anything, boxing. Um, but as was described before I came onto stage, I'm more of a heavyweight, and Scott is clearly a lightweight after that last presentation. Um, so, so that prescription against that homonym, that was... <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That was, that was, that was, that was me. Um, it's me putting on weight. Um, but we do need to pay Scott respect. Scott's an excellent speaker. He does his research really well. I've seen how he prepares talks. You've heard him present before. And therefore, I think it's really careful that we, can't, we shouldn't discount what Scott says. We shouldn't discount it at all. And we should think what we need to do. 
is emergency medicine a failed paradigm? That's a serious question. He might be right. Maybe what we need is a revolution. We need a revolution in emergency care, which is going to change the way that we deal with the people who are out there. This is a socialist approach. We have a whole bunch of people out there who need our help. And that's why you went into this career. And that's why you're still enthused about it. And that's why it's still important. Let's have a look at some facts. Why do we need a revolution? We need a revolution because the number of people who are attending emergency departments at the moment who need to get into the emergency revolution is huge. It's getting bigger and bigger each year. These are the figures for the UK, but it's the same around the world. Just in hospitals, 75% of people who get into hospital have to go through emergency care, and an emergency revolution will give the skills and the people who can identify those patients who need to come in and those patients who need to go home. They can safely get them into hospital, having differentiated them into the groups that they need to go. Generalists, not subspecialists. In the UK, 14.6 million people will need the help of the revolution. In the US, it's even worse. I'm glad you mentioned Japan, because 136 million people need this help every year. That is the population of Japan attending for emergency care on an annual basis, and it's getting more and more every year. We are, we will be, and we will forever be more popular than Justin Bieber. <laughs> but it's not just about that. There is something about here about taking you back to the fundamentals of being a clinician who deals with people at their hour of need. It doesn't matter whether we consider you suitable to be in our department. That's quite a paternalistic attitude. We look after people when they need us, regardless of whether it's minor injury, whether it's mental health, whether it's severe injury, or whether it's critical illness. We can be trained and we can perform, and we have been shown that we can perform at our best with all of those groups. We won't know everything about everybody. We won't know everything about every speciality, but we will be able to deliver good quality, high quality, and unique skills to all that come for us. And there's this idea. Scott talks about this concept of the emergency resuscitations, and it's quite attractive in a way, isn't it? This idea that we should have lots and lots of specialists. And do we need concert pierceness? Or could we be accused of being something like in a one-man band, the emergency revolutionary, being somebody who can do everything for everybody, but perhaps not brilliant at everything? Well, I would challenge that view. Specialists are very good at doing what they do, but patients don't come to us like that. Patients come to us with a whole range of things. It's not always clear what's wrong with them. ST elevation MI, that's actually pretty easy to deal with. I know what to do with that. If it's a severe sepsis, it's pretty easy. I know what to do with that. The skill of the emergency revolutionary, the emergency revolution will give us the skills to work with the undifferentiated patients, to sift in those areas of our care where patients may appear to have minor illness, we'll have the skills and the ability to spot the serious ones. If you've only got a very limited view of the world, you won't be able to do that. You won't have that breadth of knowledge, that breadth of wisdom that helps our patients. And we'll be good at this. The ability to diagnose, the ability to make probabilistic decisions, to work with uncertainty, that's not what specialists do. That's a generalist approach, and you need a broad church and a broad range of abilities to do that. That's why we need a revolution. If emergency medicine has failed, this is what we need to train our people to do. And we will be magpies. We will take those technologies from the specialists and bring them to the bedside. Ultrasound, interpretation of diagnostic tests, point of care testing, that's all within our grasp. There is nothing that we cannot do which the patient needs at their hour of need. And like all revolutions, this is not just us. Not just here in Dublin at SMAC, but all around the world, societies have taken up emergency care and emergency revolution as a thing that they should move forward with. If you look around the world over the last few years, organizations have come together to say that emergency care is where we need to be and emergency revolution will take place across the world. It's already happening. And back to our public. They know that we're there. They know that we're there for them and we do a good job. It's fine for us to say, it doesn't work for me. But that's not why we're here. We're here to serve our population, to serve the people who pay us, and to do a great, great job. We'll be revered 
in song, in movies, in television. Everybody thinks we're awesome. <laughs> so Scott, we need a revolution. You're right. Emergency medicine paradigms are interesting, aren't they? Because almost by the time you define a paradigm, it's gone. Emergency medicine a few years ago was very different. Emergency medicine, as you describe now, is also very different. We need something new. Perhaps we need a new thing. You talked about the specialty of resuscitation care. I think we can be more broad than that. We need to encompass all those things that we do as emergency revolutionaries. We need a new faculty. I agree with Scott on this. He's right. We need to embrace those elements that make us special, that will really characterize us. We need to be the faculty of excellence, care, kindness, and emergency revolution. <laughs> and I think it's only fitting that Scott should be the first honorary member of the faculty. But it's not just for him. It's not just for him. If you look under your chair now, if you look under every single chair, it might be just down the back of the seat in front of you, you'll find a small envelope. And in that envelope, you'll find instructions about, there's a little QR code on it that tells you how to get onto the faculty web. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. No money. No. Zip. Why not? Everything I've just described is what emergency medicine is. So we don't need a revolution because we're already doing this. And that's the point. We don't need a revolution. That's the point. Emergency medicine already is an awesome paradigm. We just need to follow the journey. Thank you for your time. So in a minute, I'm going to turn this over to Michelle, but I did not properly introduce these very well-established gentlemen. I was being sarcastic when I said they're just starting out in their career. You can find Simon. He's an emergency physician in Manchester, very well-established. You can find him in terms of uh, St. Amelin's be uh, Best Bets, and he's all over the FOMED world. Scott, of course, is EM Crit, working in New York, uh, just outside New York City and um, a uh, originator of SMAC. So uh, one more round of applause for these gentlemen. Excellent, excellent, excellent debate. Lots of fun. Michelle, what can you offer for us? You we started forward. out, our pre-debate poll had the yes at 18%, a paltry 18%, and 82% for no. By the end of the debate, we had 29% for yes and 71% for no. So what that means is, in fact, Scott won on the basis of how much he changed hearts Delta. and minds. But Simon got an offer of marriage from the, the audience, and he does have the greater percentage. So I think that means Simon is the winner. Excellent. Thank you.